So here we are, sharing secrets of the soil with me, your host, Regen Ray. Hello, soil lovers. Welcome to another episode of Secrets of the Soil. I'm your host, Regen Ray, and today we're going to dig deep into our soils with Michael Kilpatrick. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Ray. Excellent. So share with our community a little bit about who you are and uh, what part of the world you're joining me from today. Yeah, so we live in the southwest Ohio. So we have uh, a small eight acre urban farm here. We're actually within the city limits for our own actual um, agricultural district is what they call it. We have our own little agricultural district here, but so we are full-time farmers. We also have a online education company that we help farmers around the world called Growing Farmers. And we focus on helping farmers uh, learn business and marketing skills so they can um, work less hours and do more of what they love and enjoy it and make money at it. So that's uh, about me. I've been in agriculture for now 17 years. So I started quite young with uh, building a farm with my brother in upstate New York. We ran that for a decade. And uh, now we relocated here in Ohio about five years ago and then started a new farm here. Actually, about a year ago, we bought the property and uh, now it's full steam ahead. Excellent. And I've loved watching your journey online. You do do a lot of sharing, even though you might not share enough. Or we were speaking before off camera about some of the projects yeah. that you're working on, but I loved, I've loved watching your journey and just kind of sitting on the sidelines, someone here in Australia and seeing what is happening uh, over your side of over the woods. You mentioned that you got involved in farming 17 years ago. Do you recall that memory of like when you got really interested in the soil side of farming and nurturing the soil? Yeah. Um, so one of the first things we did is, you know, obviously, uh, especially 17 years ago, it was all about tillage. You know, everyone was like, till it, till it, till it. Let's say again. So we did tillage, but the first things we were doing after that is we were taking the grass clippings. We were collecting grass clippings and straw and hay and sticking that on the soil, the mulch. And we just always noticed how the quality of the soil was so much improved with through that. So that really opened us up into doing a lot more mulching. We were actually on the farm doing probably about two acres every year of mulch crops. Um, we use biodegradable plastics, um, like uh, usually carbon and uh, like a corn based plastic. And then we'd mulch between that. We had a, a very specific uh, bale chopper. So we'd basically eat five foot bales, chew them up, spit them out, chopped up between the beds. And uh, there's so many advantages of that. It stops the water from running off the fields. It keeps the crops clean. So it reduces disease. It keeps the workers clean. Um, it, it basically helps uh, feed the earthworms and feed the soil at the same time. So that was a great system. And, and really, even though we were relatively hard on the soil with tillage, we always were seeing our soil quality get better and organic matter every year increase because of the large amounts of carbon we were adding to the soil. So, yeah, I mean, yes, we're trying to go to reduce tillage as much as possible, but there is also other techniques I think out there which can really help do that. So that was kind of our journey. And then obviously with cover crops, we did a ton of cover crops as well, but was a one like specific, um, I mean, going way, way back to Westfield, which is where I lived when I was in my, uh, my, uh, yeah, like 10, 12, um, we started a garden and, you know, tilling that soil, we did the, the John Jevons double digging method. I mean, seriously with the wheelbarrows of soil and, you know, digging out that top foot and moving it forward. Eight, yeah. So we did all that, which actually was a lot of tillage when you think of it. Um, you know, broad fork kind of has like, you know, completely, uh, revolutionized that aspect, but, I remember, you know, adding the peat moss, adding the composted cow manure, and then watching the garden explode from literally a sandbox. I mean, we had our entire three quarters of an acre, there was a sandbox. And it was amazing to see the difference that, you know, adding an organic matter, adding that fertility, that organic fertility made to the, the soil. Yeah. And so when you were going, and I think this is really important is because the agriculture industry really made the net worth of a farmer or a gardener, how much they were digging or how busy they were in the garden, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, and, and now we're starting to see the reverse of that as like being an observer of the land and learning how to just sit with nature and be with nature and, and, and see that. I'm curious to know when you were digging into your soil and you mentioned about organic matter and, and um, are you doing testings or are you just visually looking at the soil and what are you looking for? Is it color, smell, touch? Yeah. Yeah. We do testing. We actually test a lot. We'll do it as much as two times a year. Um, especially this year because we had to move some soil because we're really changing things rapidly. Definitely things will get tested twice this year. Um, 
So we're always looking for that. We're always, um, and then we're, we're microdosing too with, with fertility. So we don't to, to dump a bun on, bunch on at the beginning of the year. We add every single crop, we're adding some, we're testing. Um, we have like, we did some earth moving for our, our large greenhouse. We put up a 36 by 200 foot greenhouse. And so when you build a pad that size, you actually have to do a fair amount of soil movement. And we actually had to cut down and expose some subsoil. Um, and so, you know, regenerating that has been challenging. I mean, we have some decent crops growing on. It looks pretty good. Um, we brought in a lot of peat moss or some compost. We're using some prebiotics, um, which are really incredible. Um, we've saw, we saw an eight, 19% increase in yield from some AB trials with those prebiotics on some of our cropping. So, um, but Is we're always- spray or seed inoculation? Or? Uh, you can do it with anything. It's got 250 different strains of bacteria in it. Right. And um, you can put it on the, the seed treatment is actually like the cheapest way to use it, but it's actually cheap. I mean, like, um, I forget the prices, like $30 a gallon or something. And a gallon will do an acre um, four times. And yeah, yeah. so um, it's relatively, you can use a foliar spray too. So it's relatively cheap, but we're seeing, you know, we're seeing a lot of things with it. We're seeing the soil opening up better. Um, we're seeing yield increasing, disease decreasing, and just soil, uh, general soil health better as well. But um, so yeah, we're testing twice a year. We're also doing leaf testing, sap testing too, with, especially with our, our heavy hitters, like our tomatoes and stuff like that. Um, but once we get into the soil, you know, we're always, you know, looking at the soil, looking at the organic life in the soil. So we were, our farm before we bought it, um, the year before it had 11 different herbicides sprayed on it. Everything from 2,4-D to dicambia to Roundup to, you know, the, just the nasty stuff of the nasties. And so, you know, we kind of regenerated it from there. I mean, it was first to doing a bare fallow to kind of get rid of some of those weeds, because as soon as those pesticides and herbicides start to wear off, the weeds just explode. And so we have everything from, um, uh, we have everything from, um, thistles to vine milkweed, which is like a really nasty bindweed. Um, and then all the annuals. So you've got your, um, your pigweed, your lamb's quarters, um, chickweed, that kind of stuff. Um, thankfully we don't have a lot of purslane. We have very little purslane and we also have very little gallon soga. So we haven't seen that one yet. So I'm praying they don't show up, but that's the other thing we're looking at. So we're always looking at the weeds that are coming up because the weeds can tell us about the soil too. Yeah. And based on the weeds, we have relatively healthy soil. I mean, we have very few thistles. I mean, we, I, I know on the farm right now, we have probably about six or eight thistle plants and I can tell you exactly where they are. And so that means tech, usually the soil is a little tight there. And so we'll add a little extra calcium on there. Um, the vine milkweed, that's another story. That's kind of a nasty one. We've tried really hard to get rid of it. I think the only way to really get rid of it is just repeated um, tillage or tarping it for a long time. But with tarping, you're going to be out there for a very long time because it's very regenerative and just very robust. Um, so we're looking at the, you know, looking at this, um, the soil and putting our hands in it, looking at the life. So seeing how many earthworms are in it. It's really cool when you have like a really good, no-till cover crop on it. You'd say you chop that all up and let it lie on top of the soil. And then you come out after a rain, after a week or so. And what will happen is if you have a good earthworm population, they will actually go outside their little circle and gather all the pieces of grass and the pieces of bioorganic matter and make a little mound around their, um, their hole. I mean, I've seen it as high as like three inches. Oh. Um, then, then you can just like pop that little cap off and it'll be a mix of all that organic matter that they're collecting as well as all their earthworm droppings. And so they're basically making a little tiny like uh, bio-fermentation like right there, which is kind of really cool to see. And so that's always cool to see. And obviously the more tillage you go, the less earthworms you're going to get. So how can we um, you know, manage this? And what we've done so far, and it's... <sighs> It's not as well as I would like because we're still struggling with getting enough nitrogen on it, but anything that's not in production, and for us, that's typically vegetable production, is in a no-till cover crop. So we've now no-tilled that field for over a year, and we've no-tilled three different cover crops in. It went from a six or eight-way cover crop with majority species of sunflower and cowpeas to a winter cover crop of rye and clovers. We took off the rye and clover, we bailed it. We'll use that as mulch between our beds on our strawberry production. And then we went back into a sunflower mix. Now we're having trouble with those sunflowers getting enough fertility. Um, 
We have lots of phosphorus and potassium, all, but it's a little tied up in our nitrogen. I thought that we would have enough from the lot of clover because when we, when we took off the rye, we cut the clover to the ground and that usually will cause the clover to sloth off and release some of that nitrogen, but I think we didn't release enough nitrogen. Right. So our third cover crop isn't coming back like I want. The clover is actually completely out competing everything else. So we may have to go in and try to terminate the clover and then get another cover crop to establish. So, um, which is unfortunate because clover is awesome and we want to feed our bees and all of that. Yeah. But um, if we really want to feel the sunflowers, which people want to come take pictures at, yeah. then we have to have actually sunflowers out there. So <laughs> that. that's where we are right now with that. Um, yeah, but our goal is to be able to swap out some of these field sections that we planted on this year. So typically we'll double crop and we like to actually crop a field as much as we can in one year and then go back into two or three years of long-term cover crop um, instead of like crop, cover crop, crop, cover crop, because the long-term a cover crop is where you can get those deep roots of the sweet clovers and, you know, even rye, cereal rye is to get some decent roots on it. Um, but yeah, I'd like to get multiple years of that and keep cutting that. So you get in the sloth and then regrow and sloth and then regrow because that really helps, um, get the carbon released down into the soil. Yeah. And I just love the way that when you're explaining all of this, you're, understanding of like what's happening above the ground is telling a, a, a bigger story below the ground, you know, understanding oh, all the different species are doing from a, you know, adding, removing, aerating, um, and, and really, you know, deep roots and what that's doing the, the worms and how they're going out and collecting everything and doing the heavy lifting for us, you know, where if you just think about a tiller going through that land every year, it's never going to have that ability to heal and regenerate the way that you've just explained it. But what we can't see is below the ground, but there are so many signals above the ground mm -hmm. that tell us a bigger, um, bigger story or, you know, the start of that story. Anyway, you've mentioned regenerative a lot, what does regenerative mean to you as a farmer and someone who's been on the land? What does the word regenerative mean to you? Yeah, well, I think it's it comes really down to stewarding the land and leaving it better than we found it. And I think that's kind of like our our basic aspect. I mean, yeah, there's aspects of cover of uh, you know pesticides and herbicides and all this other stuff and you know erosion, but it all comes back down. To, yes, those are all like symptoms or like things that are expressed. But if, it, if at the end of the day, my soil is double the organic matter, I have double the amount of worms, I'm seeing parasitic wasps, and I'm not seeing the pests that I usually do, and it's feeding more people, that's what to me regenerative is. And it's feeding more people without you know, massive amounts of inputs. Mm -hmm. And to me, yes, there's like, so we do a lot of inputs and let's say like a lot of straws and a lot of um, wood chips, but a lot of those, wood, those inputs are free. Like the wood chips for us are free. They're actually helping, they're being less than landfill. So to me, I know in one aspect, I'm not really counting that as like an input because it like, it, it literally was a, it was a less of a strain on the larger ecosystem. Yeah. Um, and we'll even take those wood chips and we'll throw wood chips down in our drive paths in the field. Um, and even like, so we'll go through and like, just drop some on, even on top of our, our, even they're sodded. So we'll throw a little bit on and then the sod will grow through that. And so basically we're just creating this massive spongy mess um, which is basically, um, you know, soaking up the moisture and, uh, and creating this, 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 this living basically path through our entire farm. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of the big thing is, you know, leaving the, and obviously, you know, we've, we're exporting, uh, lots of vegetables. We're very intensive. So like a bed can produce, you know, 150, 200, 300, 400 pounds of, uh, produce a year easily, you know, especially like if you're double, triple cropping that. Um, so we're definitely going to have some inputs, but the inputs are a lot different than a farm that is not, you know, as regenerative. Um, one of the problems is, is where we are, we're an eight acre um, urban farm is we aren't really allowed to have a lot of animals here. So we were picking our battles, you know, first thing was, you know, there's different battles to pick with the town and we've picked some other battles currently, but the next battles will be around that because again, we want to get animals on property. And one aspect of being a vegetable mushroom and, uh, you know, horticulture farm is um, they don't talk back and they tend not to run away. 
Um, so when you do get animals, we're going to start working with that. So one aspect, I'm okay with pushing that off a little bit, but I do know that animals are the best way to um, regenerate soil fast. And you know, currently right now we buy in our eggs for our farm stand and that we export to them a lot of our seconds. So they get a lot of our squash seconds and our microgreen seconds. Um, but I'd love to have that all happening on farm. Yeah, I love that. And you've just mentioned your little stand idea and we were talking off camera. Can you share with the soil lovers listening today about your whole kind of paddock to, you know, play? Yeah, farms yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So originally, um, you know, we bought this property because it has 12,000 cars that go by it a day. And, uh, you know, there's, there's pluses and minuses of that. Um, you know, people will show up on a Sunday afternoon and we're closed at 6 PM. Hey, can I get a tomato? And we're like, yeah, no, not happening. Um, so you have to deal with that. So that's the downside, but there's so many other pluses, the pluses of people stopping in and be able to walk around the farm and see where their food is grown. Beautiful. Um, so we bought the property with that idea of getting massive traffic on the farm to see how is their food grown. Um, across the street was a corner lot um, that was vacant and we were going to put a farm stand in. Um, we worked with the city and struggled and you know, s- uh, many sleepless nights and tens uh, over $10,000 in planning costs to get to the point to realize there's going to be a $100,000 investment to simply put up a 16 by 24 foot building. And they, they, they don't do anything like there's no gray area. There's no like, you're not a Walmart. You just want to have a little a farm stand. It's like your business and business has all these ridiculous codes that are, need, that are needed. Um, so we were, after we kind of like looked at the costs and looked at everything, we're like, this is not going to work. And by this time I've read through, you know, every single page, every 900 pages of the, the town code. And I know them inside and out. So I know like, okay, if I wanted, how do I get around this? Well, um, if we don't want to, we can't build anything. Cause if you build something then you have to go through a development plan and go back to the city for that, but you're allowed to park an RV on your property and you can buy a bus and you can, uh, you can license it as an RV and that way it's not fastened to the ground. It's sitting on its wheels. So that's what we did. And we also um, started in the US what's called a private membership association. So um, ours is t- typically technically a food church. Um, uh, it, you know, we're not like, it, and again, you, to start a food church, you just have to be religious and your religion can be as much as you believe in the power of food to regenerate. Um, and yes, there's all sorts of religions out there. So, I mean, obviously, you know, I have a, a faith background, but it wasn't like we didn't start the church around that faith background. He says, you know, do you believe in like the power of good food to heal? And I'm like, yes. He's like, okay, you have a food church now. So <laughs> I, love that- that. I love that innovation <laughs> and thinking outside the box. That's crazy. So technically we're not selling anything on our property. So the city or the town, because they're not a city, because they're under 5,000 people, um, they, they cannot get us on selling things. They can't require us to have permits and licensing around that because no one's buying anything. They're technically donating to our food church and then just picking up produce. Um, so that was the two things we kind of had to do to get up and operational on this property um, was to, you know, A, have a farm uh, way to sell that didn't require building new structures and getting new permits, as well as then not being in general commerce, which is what the private membership association is all about. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of how we set up. And what we ended up doing was we found an old transit bus and the transit buses are nice because they are low to the ground. So it's not like you're walking up into, let's say a school bus or walking up into a coach bus. It's very low to the ground. There are, the floor is about a foot off the ground and um, you can rip all the seats out and we put in a, a cooler. I mean, if you go to our, go to Facebook and go to farm on central and just type that in, you'll see dozens of videos we, every week we tour people around the bus with what's good and what's for sale. And so people are, you can see that on there, how we have it set up. Um, and we just recently, as I was telling you right earlier, we set it up as a self-service. So yes, Friday and Saturday, it's manned. We go out and pick massive amounts of piles of produce and we have that all there and someone out there talking to people. But Monday, Thursday now, it's set up self-service with a little kiosk and uh, a ring button. So if they need service, they can press the button and it'll ring in the house. Um, so all that is set up now and, uh, and working. And uh, we're pretty excited about that. Our first day, you know, it's literally today was our first day of being fully open self-service. And we're really surprised that, you know, how much, um, how much sales we did um, with just literally people driving by and seeing the sign saying we're open. 
wow. and Facebook videos. So. Well, it's hot off the press. We're hearing it first. I love that. Just, you know, so lovers, if you're out there thinking about how can you sell directly, you know, here's an innovative way that's gotten around town planning or to council concerns. You know, if there's a will, there is a, there is a way, you know, and so this is really cool, Michael, for sharing that because I, I know that so many people get stuck on this topic of like how to sell directly. And most people just give up. They go, you know what? This is too hard. I'm going to go through the mainstream. We're going to put into a co-op. We're going to sell it to commodity markets. We're going to mm. lose money just so we can sell something and not end up having to dump it. Um, but, you know, you're yeah. stacking enterprises too. You're taking people on tours. You're having conversations with them. People are getting to know the farmer. Like this is serving a community on so many different levels. Um, it's so, so innovative. Thank you. Yeah. And I think the tool thing, you know, I, obviously I'm not sure, I know you have, you know, soil lovers all around the world listening. Um, so I'm not sure the different rules in the different countries. Yeah. Um, so, but the thing about a private membership too, is that we now skip a lot of the rules and regulations around prepared foods and processed foods. Um, so that we are making our own pickles, which pickles are now our number one grossing item in our bus. Oh. We're selling more pickles than anything else throughout the week. Um, we're making our own mayonnaise. We're making our own zoodles. So taking zucchini and just spiralizing those, we're selling those. Um, so we're being able to use a massive amount of stuff that would hit the waste stream um, because we're no longer having to comply with all those regulations. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it, 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 it really have to look at what your county, what your state, what your country allows. Um, but, um, if, if they are interested in that, make sure they reach out to us. Cause we have, we are starting to put together a lot more information around this because again, to us, we want farmers to succeed. Um, we want farmers to grow products and sell it to their neighbors. And we want to break down the barriers, as you said, to do that. Um, because as I said earlier, we spent over $10,000 on just planning to put up a little 16 by 24 foot, uh, farm stand. And, um, I mean, that wasn't, wasn't even like that was a production of building that out was going to be a hundred thousand dollars. So yeah, I mean the bus, we could have bought the bus and been in business two months earlier, <laughs> you know, but now, now, now you've got this gift of educating others and sharing that story. And I think, you know, sometimes we have to go somewhere to then come back and, um, oh, yeah. hope, you know, and, and so I, I think, you know, the bus idea and the whole, you know, unmanned, vehicle I just think is, is amazing because you, you're giving people the experience to in, interact with your brand without you having to physically create more of you or hire mm -hmm. staff and that again is another concern that farmers always have is like I don't want to have a open gate or a farm gate because it means that I have to always be available I can't go on mm -hmm. holidays um, and you know your bus is movable you could take it to a farmer's market if you wanted to you know and take it or take it on the road so I think that's a, a, a great idea and I'm gonna go google buses after this chat <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So the other cool thing, Ray, is that it allows us to take the bus on the road. So yes, the bus is stationary. It's open six days a week, but what we will end up doing is we'll put on the sign and say, Hey, the bus is gone for the afternoon because we are in our local community, another local community providing amazing food to them. Um, so we can literally, it's all set up. We can just get on the road. It's uh, interesting to drive. You know, transit buses are not the easiest thing to drive, um, but it is, it will allow us to, you know, take that on the road and, uh, and literally have a mobile farmer's market that's providing products from, um, let's see how many different, we have, I think like six different uh, farmers and artisans now represented on the bus. So we provide 95% of the vegetables on there, but we buy in honey, eggs, milk, uh, elderberry products. Um, and, uh, you know, open the talking to other vendors too, about like actually having like meat and that sort of thing on there as well. Amazing. So inspirational. This is like the way the future and the economy, you know, this is how farms can stack other enterprises, scale, meet their producers in the area, collaborate together. You know, you've solved a problem, not just for yourself, but for the whole community, mm -hmm. which is just so, so awesome to hear. And, um, you know, I really hope that others hear this conversation and, and get inspired to, you know, get inspiration and, 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 and make, make copies of this, you know, because this is where mass uh, change of buying behaviors happen. Um, people mm -hmm. can go and, and buy locally, just that it's not easy sometimes. And we, we're busy than ever before. And so we, we default to the convenience prepackaged foods or the, the Uber that drives it to our door, you know, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very, very cool to hear. Um, with you, I, I've seen your journey over the years and I want to just dabble a little bit in the whole, I know you came from like leasing land and then acquiring your own. And it's been a bit of a journey 
Um, mm-hmm. Can you just share a little bit of the pros and cons that you've felt firsthand and the difference between working someone else's land and then getting your own parcel of land? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, when we farmed in New York, I first started my parents' property and we bought eight acres. We moved up there in 1999 and we had no idea. We weren't farmers. So we bought a rocky steep with very little water. Um, and the driver is a thousand foot long and the first 400 feet were a 15 degree grade. Um, and so, you know, that was upstate middle of winter, upstate New York. I mean, I think it was a sheet of ice. So it was, again, it was literally a very poor piece of property to buy. Thankfully it all faced South. So it had a really great Southern exposure and had a good, actually really nice quality upland soil. But because of the lack of water, it really meant we were very limited with what we could grow. We had five gallons a minute if we were lucky in the middle of the summer. Um, and so what we needed was other property. And so we started talking to other people and, and picking up other pieces. And eventually we were managing around 500 acres across six different landowners in about a four mile radius. Um, and, you know, obviously if you have the money, if you can buy property, own it and just have it, um, you know, that is the ultimate but the problem is land is expensive. Now, it always really depends too if you're land intensive or land extensive. So land intensive is usually vegetables, um, some vineyard, cut flowers, um, mushrooms is incredibly intensive if you're you know, not doing like logs and having to be in the forest. Um, if you're doing like agritourism, that can be really intensive. You're doing like farm, let's say you're at a pizza farm where you did everything except the wheat and had people come on site to actually make pizza. That's incredibly intensive as well. And that can actually be incredibly high margins. Um, but extensive would be your cattle, your, your, you know, grains, that kind of thing where it's a very low dollar per acre. I mean, if you look at some of these um, like wheat farmers, they're making 15, $20 an acre but they're doing 10,000 acres. So that's where their money comes in. It's all about scale there. Um, so if you're intensive, own your own land, obviously, because then you can sink your heart and soul into it. You're not worried about investments. You're not worried about spending $2,000 in soil amendments per acre because you know you got the lifespan and you're gonna come bring that back. But if you're leasing land, um, you never know if it's gonna lose it. Now, if you are leasing land, we love to see, or renting land, we love to see a five-year rolling lease. So that means that every year you sign a brand new lease so that you're going to have it for five years. And that way you have maximum knowing of like when you're going to lose the land. And the nice thing about that is so, um, you know, like they would choose not to renew. Okay. You've got multiple years to figure out your exit strategy slash your next options. Um, Sometimes you won't get that at the beginning of your farming career. You rarely get that. It takes a lot of trust to get there. So when we first started, we had poor pieces of property by year six, we finally were able to find a long-term someone that would sign a multi-year lease. And the only reason that I came to him one year and he said, nope, I want to see your track record. Basically, that's what he told me without telling me that directly. And after a couple of years, he came back and said, I'm ready to do the, the deal. And we will pick up 12 acres of prime river bottom and to have, you know, really good um, tenure on that. But um, so if you are going to sign a lease, you obviously want to get everything in writing. You want to get a lawyer to look over both sides. Um, you have to ask all the hard questions. Don't assume, don't think that it might or might not happen. We, the big things for us is what about pests? Can we, you know, fence it? Can we shoot deer on it? Can we trap groundhogs? Um, pruning back hedgerows is always a thing. Can we prune back the hedgerows, trees? What are we allowed and not allowed to use on the property? Um, what are they allowed to do and not allowed to do in the property? Are you allowed to fence it to keep people out? We had a lot of um, trespassing. And so some of the landowners were not okay with us stopping it. Some of them were okay with us stopping it. Um, so that's all the things you really need to think about. Um, is, are there advantages to releasing land? Yeah, land is just expensive. Um, if we were trying to own that 500 acres, that would have been around 750 to probably a couple million dollars in upstate New York. Land's cheap up there. You can get a land for as little as $1,500 an, $1, an acre, but it's pretty poor quality land up there. But I mean, where we are now in Ohio, seven to 10,000 an acre. Um, you know, other places, California, it's $100,000 an acre. So sometimes leasing is your only option, um, but just try to protect yourself as much as possible and don't overextend yourself. I'd rather see you start on an acre, do it really, really well, and then scale up. Um, and it's really nice if you can't, make, let's say you have a 20 acre piece of property and you're like, oh my gosh, I want to get this whole acreage, but I only am going to farm my one acre, plant it to hay, just, just bush hog it if you have to. 
Um, that's the cheapest way to do it or, and, or just like have somebody do the hay because hay is relatively chemical free. They're not going to throw a lot of chemicals on it typically. And it's, it's helping the soil. Um, it's removing a little bit of organic matter, but again, most of that's the roots under the soil. So that's going to keep the, the, the soil in relatively good condition. Yeah. I love that. And did something psychologically change when it was your land and someone else's land? Like, were you always just thinking I'm doing this, but I'm not going to get the long-term benefits mm -hmm. or were you happy to pass that on to the next farmer? Um, it was tough because literally that, that place that we actually moved the year we, um, or shut our farm down the year that, that we were able to certify that last piece of property. <laughs> so it was a three-year transition and year three, my wife was like, I want to be in Ohio near my family. Cause we just had a kid. And I was like, oh, okay. So oh, we lost that. Um, we were able to pass that on to somebody else, but I mean, there's a massive psychological shift. I mean, we're planting perennials. We're planting 50 year trees here. So, because we know that's the long term, um, we're like, we're looking at all eight acres and like, and, and, and before I put a building up, I'm talking to four or five people. I'm like, eh, I'm not sure about this. Do I want to put this here? Do I want to orient to this here? Uh, and, uh, so it's like, you're on one aspect, you're second guessing yourself a lot because you realize the time span is so much longer. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, if you put in a bed of, of willows, obviously willows are relatively easy to eradicate, but if you're putting a row of evergreens or you're putting a row of fruit trees, that's a lot different. Um, one of the things we did when we moved here is we had a foodscaper come in and design all eight acres of this property um, to basically be profitable. So we've got hedges and there's hedges of, I think we have over a hundred different varieties and, and types of different things on there. Um, everything from elderberries to willows to um, perennial flowers, you know, echinacea to pawpaws to um, Chinese chestnuts to, you know, the, the, this, we're having hops grow up the side of the house because they shade in the summer. And then in the winter, you strip the hops down and the sun hits the house to try to heat it. Because um, we, we live in an 1890s um, double bricked, a big square house, um, which is a small fortune to heat and cool. But we love oh, old houses. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All of our carbon credits are sequestered. <laughs> um, so, um, so yeah, so it's, um, uh, so that's the kind of the things we did and, and no one's going to spend several thousand dollars on something like that, unless they're going to be there for a while. Yeah. So that's the kind of stuff, you know, we're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's completely different. We're cleaning back the hedgerows. We're opening things up. We're, you know, working on long-term relationships with the neighbors. We're actually trying to buy the properties that abut us because we're all houses around us, but we're looking for long-term employee housing. So that's the kind of stuff we're thinking about. It's the long-term, we're going to be here for a couple decades yeah. or, and not necessarily us, but this farm will be here for multiple decades because I don't know, you know, five, 10 years, we are building this to sell. And that was one of the other major things different from the farm we built in New York to the farm we built here is we didn't build this with our name attached intentionally because the farm on central can be sold to anyone. Yes. The, the next farm family can steward this and it's going to be an amazing farm in five to 10 years. Um, but they'll be able to steward it. And I may move on to some other project. I don't know what the future holds, but um, we are building this for the long term, and we want it to be a farm for the long term. So if we could conserve it and preserve the eight acres in like a trust, we would. Um, most farm, uh, most development, tr like people who are buying development, like farm um, trust or something, they won't buy such a small acreage. But if we build out the eight acres as you know an incredible. Um, you know, regenerative permaculture slash just uh, urban uh, mecca, they probably will be interested. Um, so yeah, hopefully that will happen at some day because it, it really, really be cool once we finish out the build. Yeah. And I love that mindset too, to build the farm to sell. I think that's a really good mindset, even just in any business, because you don't have to sell it but you can, if you want to, you know, yeah. so many people decide to sell a business or a farm 10, 15 years into their journey and then everything's out of order. And then they spend mm -hmm. the next five years trying to put everything back in order. So mm -hmm. with that mindset from the front, I think it's really, really good. And even the foodscaping side of things, I see this trend, you know, landscaping was one thing, but now foodscaping, you know, that ability to design land. So not only are you creating a windbreak, but it also creates a flower that you can then have people come and pick during mm -hmm. a farm tour, you know, it's like yep. those are really smart, innovative, small tweaks you can make 
that something's going to grow there as a windbreak or a hedge, but now it has another purpose as well, or you can harvest the berries from it. And then that makes jam and you constantly like create mm -hmm. derivatives on your farm of other produce. Well, I think what you said there was important, Ray, is derivatives, because right now we have three different main enterprises. We have the vegetables, we have, well, four now, because we added the uh, value added. We have the horticulture, which is the greenhouse for transplants, and we have mushrooms. But once everything is going, we're going to have woody ornamentals. We're going to have like 10 or 15 types of fruits. We're going to have um, uh, basically uh, planting stock for all these different willows and uh, elderberries. So we'll be able to sell that every spring. We're going to have uh, carbon coming off. Anything that doesn't get sold is going to be chewed up as and go back into the soil. Um, we'll have other planting stock with the echinacea and the comfrey. Um, so, I mean, there's going to literally be 15 or 18 different revenue streams and it's going to be perennial. So it's not like at the ground planted every year. These are going to be perennial, uh, basically uh, places throughout the thing, which are going to be sequestering carbon because they're going to be covered with 12 to 18 inches of mulch, um, or maybe more like you know eight to 16. Um, but you know, they're, so they're going to basically we're going to be this massive carbon sponge that also has. I mean, basically we're going to have all these different income streams. And we'll be able to shut down or greatly constrict. The, the annual side of the farm, which is a very heavy uh, labor side too, because planting ahead of lettuce and harvesting that, that's a lot of labor, but an elderberry tree, very little. And you're gonna cut, yeah, there's so many different income streams from all that as well. Yeah, and sometimes people sit there going, how am I gonna pick it? And it's like, no, people will pay to come to pick a for you, you know? Oh yeah. It's, 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 it's the way when you start thinking outside the box and seeing everything as a, a, a way of creating community and see some of the traditional farms, they're stuck in this world of biosecurity because they've always played the chemical and the toxic mm -hmm. life. And so, yeah, you have bio risk, but when you grow a food forest and an abundant farm, like you're describing, there is no bio risk. If anything, people coming on the property is biodiversity. It's other minds. It's like, oh, have you ever thought of doing this? And I've seen this on another farm. And then all of a sudden you're like, awesome. That's the problem I've been trying to solve, you know? Yes. So yeah. how long have you been on this farm? Like what's this farm model look like and how long is, because you've shared some really good like ideas and inspiration. And I know some people might be sitting there going, God, this, like I've run out of time to do this, but it seems like you've done this. Yeah. Quickly. Well, yeah, we bought the property. We closed on the property July 1st of last year. So we bought a property in the middle of a pandemic, which is not easy. Um, I have more gray hair because of that process. <laughs> Don't worry. And for our Australian listeners, closing on a property means settling a property. Same thing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's the wording you use over there. Cool. Um, so um, we, we, we actually, because it's a very unique situation, a church had pot, brought the property. They were going to try to move the house on the property and build their church building. They ended up not doing to multiple factors. So they were great to work with. They were, you know, they send their parishioners here to buy from us, which is super cool. Um um, and, uh, so yeah, we still actually, you know, very good friends with a lot of the people from the church. So a great working relationship with them. They let us get onto the field before we actually closed. So we were able to do some work on the fields and, and the house and store stuff and start doing some renovations and stuff. Um, so we did the kind of that kind of stuff, but, um, I mean, yeah, this is going to be a six to eight year build out. And, you know, I was on a podcast and I said something to the effect of that. I probably won't make money for three to four years. And someone was like, oh my gosh, don't tell farmers that. And I was like, this is our journey. We have an incredibly ambitious goals. We have, we're blessed that we have multiple income streams that we're able to sink a lot of money into this as well as taking out loans and stuff. But if, again, they will loan you money if they see ROI and you can see a business plan. And, uh, you know, so at the end of this year, we have to go to our bankers and show them where we are and the kinds of things, but they'll say, and we will say, Hey, this failed, this worked. We're seeing massive growth here. We're going to double down on that. And they'll be willing to hand us more money because they'll be like, okay, cool. So I think that's another thing is a lot of farmers don't understand the money game. And that's kind of what it is a lot of time when you're working with these lenders. And, uh, um, in the U S we have multiple funding options, which I, th I know some people around the world don't have, which is kind of. Uh, nice to have. Uh, we have federal and uh, private and stuff like that. So there's all sorts of ways. There's a lot of ways to crowdfund too. If you have a really good idea, you can crowdfund incredibly. There's really cool ways to do that too for anyone. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, we're going to be building, I mean, we're not going to take a salary from this for a long time, but we realized that after six, seven years, the money will just be compounding upon itself because of the other, the income streams coming in. Um, and yes, this foodscaping is going to take three, four years because I just don't have the bandwidth to put in literally 6,000 different plants. Um, we've done like three or four different sections of it. And the other thing was getting the plants too. So this fall, we'll start to source, you know, another 30% of that. We'll start to build out the beds. Um, we really probably should be starting to prep those beds now because we know where some of that stuff needs to go. So, I mean, even if it's just rototilling the area and starting to kill the weeds and dumping a foot of, of compost and wood chips on that, that's probably a great place to start. Um, because we do have some hedgerows and stuff that need to be completely removed before we can get this implemented. And that would actually get rid of the wood chucks, which have caused some major havoc too. So, um, I have to put that on my to-do list this week, <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's going to take a while. I mean, there's, there's, there's fast aspects and there's slow aspects. Um, you know, money solves a lot of problems. So one of the big things for us was a, a, a high quality nursery slash greenhouse. So we put up that 36 by 200. We're going to, we sunk about $60,000 us into that for everything from, you know, gas lines to irrigation, to automation, uh, we paid people to come in and put it up because if we hadn't paid them to put it up, they put it up in two days. It would have taken us a month or two months to put it up because the size of the structure, the amount of steel. Um, but that's a structure that will go through, probably won't go through a tornado, but it will go through a hurricane. It'll go through a three foot snowstorm, no problem. Um, and we can generate out, you know, massive amounts of plant material and, and in ground growing there. Um, and then we also put up four hoop houses. So for us, especially in the US, I mean, we're anywhere in the world, we getting crazier and crazier weather. So it's really important for us to have, um, to have covered production where any weather we can harvest product almost year round. So, um, well, actually year round here in Ohio, we totally can. I mean, in New York, we did it year round. So we have now, well, it's 16 by 105. So that's 1600 square feet, that's 32. So that's 6,400 square feet. And the high tunnel is 7,200 square feet. So that's 1300 square feet or almost a third of an acre. Um, I don't know what that is in hectares, but um, that's completely undercover. And so just from that, we can generate $100,000 a year. Um, so yes, we obviously grow a significant amount on outside, um, but we also want to always hedge our bets with covered production to be able to, so like if it's pouring rain, I can just have my team go inside and prune tomatoes. Um, you know, me and my team were like to talking and farm manager, like, we need to do this with the peppers. Um, we're like, well, it's going to rain Friday. So we'll just do that Friday because they're inside. And tomorrow we need to actually get some seeding done outside and get carrots in for the winter. So that's the beauty of that. So that's kind of the stuff we focused on right now. Um, some of this other stuff, it's going to take a while. We're not going to get to it right away because it's just, um, there's diminishing returns too. Like someone said, you can put solar on your roof. Oh, I want to. But the solar return is only like a 1.2 or 1.4, whereas let's say a hoop house is a one to 10. It's going to be $10 for your $1 I invest. So that's kind of where we are right now is just weighing these options and really kind of like figuring out, you know, what's the highest priority. And, and obviously, especially at the beginning, it's marketing, it's getting the money in the door. So that's where we're spending a lot of our time. And it, sometimes it feels like diminishing returns too, to send that email newsletter. Like, did I actually generate sales? But you've got to get in front of your customers. You've got to get those, those uh, weekly customers that, you know, are going to give you money every single week. Do you sleep, Michael? <laughs> Yeah, a few hours a night. <laughs> I, love it. I love it. Your mind ticks exactly like mine. I think this is why we've always kind of jammed really well. Yeah. Marketing, business, entrepreneurship background, level, you know, layer that with soil and, and regenerative farm enterprises. Um, we, you know, the whole new buzzword now is regenpreneurs. And uh, I do like that space because it's my two worlds kind of colliding together and uh, I, we can make a lot of magic. And yeah, knowing your numbers, like that's what's really important and a key. Um, distinction that I've seen with you is you, you know your numbers and that's really important and you're talking profits per acre not yields and kilos and yeah I think that's a lot well, of school thinking well yeah to that numbers thing I'm gonna bring up two points here we don't actually think profit per acre we think dollars per square foot per week perfect um, because uh, you know so just two quick examples on this is lettuce four weeks in the ground I can get a hundred pounds off a hundred foot bed um, that's thousand dollars at our wholesale price well our, our we don't actually do a lot of wholesale but we do our, our biggest seller is a, ten, a one pound bag of salad for 10 bucks that's our big seller um, so okay thousand dollars in six weeks okay that's cool now we look at tomatoes tomatoes I can get the twenty dollars 20 pounds per plant 
Um, and so let's say we can fit a hundred plants in a hundred foot bed at $3 or $4 a pound, let's say an average of 350. Um, so that's 20 pounds times a hundred plants. That's 2000 pounds times 350. So 2000, that's now $7,000. Is that the right, did I get that right? Uh, no, it's more, I'm not a mathematical uh, genius yet, but, me, um, but yeah. what you're talking about is throughput. And that's what I really like in the franchising models. They do this a lot. So yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. So that is 7,000. Yeah. That's $7,000 per hundred foot bed, but tomatoes take pruning tomatoes take 16 weeks. They take, uh, they take, uh, I need to test that every three weeks with a leaf test. So my profit is much, much higher with the lettuce because of that dollars per square foot per week and every when you add into your labor. But not everyone's gonna buy lettuce. So that's why I have to grow the tomatoes. So that's just the one side of things. We're always messing with those numbers. Let's go back over to the processing side because um, processed food, and I told you pickles are now our number one seller. So obviously I had to start figuring that out. So jars at the scale we're buying jars, they're a dollar ten a jar is for the jar and the lid and the shipping. The, lid, the shipping is almost as much as the jars, unfortunately, these days. Um, and we're gonna start buying by the pallet quantity and then it will bring it down to about 70 cents, 75 cents per jar. Uh, we have a clove of garlic in there, um, that's 50 cents. We have a sprig of dill, that's 10 cents. It takes one cucumber per jar, buying it from ourselves at retail prices. And this is better than retail because we're technically buying our seconds from ourselves for this jar. And then we have some labor. So we have a little bit of vinegar in there and the vinegar is probably 10 cents. And then we have the labor. Um, so they're charging seven for that. And so our costs, then if we look at our costs, they're three to $4. Um, and then we've got our labor on top of that, which is probably about a dollar to $2. We haven't quite run the numbers on the labor, um, but I can tell you it took my wife six hours plus uh, six hours. So 12 hours to produce 144 jars. So um, we're making money on pickles. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> and you probably so have now a spreadsheet too. <laughs> well, actually, no, I don't have it yet. I need right. to. I mean, this is the thing with number year number one on any farm. Um, as long as I know those numbers in my head and I'm like, we're actually really making money on this. Um, if I started to get where, oh, are we making money? That's when the spreadsheets come out. Yeah. Um, because then I know I really have to sharpen my pencil, but we're in the right now where we have massive, massive margin and we probably can move to eight bucks and we'd probably be completely fine on those pickles and everyone would still buy them. No one's ever questioned the price. And we have people coming back for two, three, four jars. Actually, if you go on our Facebook page right now, there's a really funny a testimonial of someone who bought a jar and posted on their private Facebook and they let us share it on our page. But, um, yeah, basically they're up at 12, 13 a.m. eating pickles because they're that good. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so, um, so yeah, I think we've hit something there. So we obviously like now, so we've sold pickles. So we're selling pickles. So now we're like, okay, how do we pivot knowing that value added seems like it's gonna be a larger aspect of our thing. A, okay, do we wanna start taking this to the masses? If that's the case, we need to get a 20 seat kitchen because the private membership association protects us selling directly to our consumer through our own channels and through like online, if like through Shopify and shipping. But if we don't go to a farmer's market or if we were to shell some other aspects, then we now enter commerce again and we are governed by those laws. So that's the one aspect, um, buying in jars by the pallet is obviously now something that will actually bring our costs down substantially and growing for it too, because I do not want to be that pickle company that buys their pickles in and all they do is process because now you're really not a farm. You're just a processor. And I want to be a farm. The goal is to have a farm where the kids can run and play and enjoy and people come to visit. So if pickles are a large portion of what we grow, great but I still want all those other aspects of the farm to be intact with that. So that's why we called up the seed companies. We're talking to them about, you know, what's going to produce the best pickle and all this stuff. And so now we're planting, you know, a lot more pickles out. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of how things are kind of shifting. And we're also like, okay, we need to up our garlic production. We need to up our dill production. Uh, no, you can't grow your own vinegar. So you're going to still buy vinegar. But to me, that's a small thing to buy. Um, but, you know, that's the kind of things where we're moving based on what the numbers tell us. Love it, love it. Michael, we could chat for days and days about this, but I want to get to the, our signature question, which is if you could be the voice of our soil, what would you tell the planet? Yeah. Uh, I think the biggest thing is, you know, uh, 
just listen to the soil. The, listen, the soil has so much to offer, so much to tell you. If you just, you know, test again, I don't know, testing, I guess, would be listening, um, feeling the soil, looking at what happens after you till it, after you, you know, treat it, you know, the different things to it. And, and just stop putting so much poison on it too. Um, you know, I think, you know, uh, even us organic farmers sometimes look at, um, you know, and we're putting stuff on, we don't need to necessarily be putting on. So, you know, like thinking about that too, but, um, you know, I, I think too, is just armor the soil, cover the soil. If you can get it covered, um, you know, again, back to, I just said, don't put pesticides and herbicides on it, but if you can use one pint or a cup of an herbicide that allows you to no-till down a, a, a eight foot cover crop and no-till into that, that's the decision you're going to have to make. In my opinion, I mean, we're organic, so we don't, but I have an incredible amount of respect for like the Steve Groffs that are the gay Browns that literally are armoring thousands and thousands of acres and in showing incredible increase of, um, of organic matter. And, you know, talking to, um, I was able to interview um, from the Rodale Institute, uh, not too long, Jeff Moyers from the Royal Institute and, and talking to them where they now have soil so healthy that they can grow any crop on any part of their farm without any fertility. He says, now I can't do that every year, but he says, we have gotten to the point where the soil is so alive and releasing so much fertility that we can do that. So, you know, listen to the soil and let's get it covered. Let's, uh, let's build that, that uh, life back into the soil. How can we get more life into the soil? Um, and uh, I, think the, I think we will change the climate change. Uh, climate change will no longer be uh, as big of an issue. What a wonderful world to live in. Thank you so much for sharing that. Michael, you've just shared so much wisdom, information, gold nuggets, and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, hanging out with you, you today. So if our soil lovers wanted to spend more time with you, how can they get uh, in touch and hang out with your brand? Yeah, yeah. So growingfarmers.com is kind of our a hub for, um, you know, everything we do on the education side. That's our podcast lives there. You can find our podcast there. You can find our educational resources. Um, I, I don't recommend people follow our, our Facebook page just because, um, it's, uh, I'm very picky about our organic reach. <laughs> and so if I go to and tell, go, go follow this, it actually kills our organic reach because Facebook doesn't know who to actually send to the page. Um, but you can, um, you can just, you can, um, so in, I guess what I'm saying, don't like the page, you can follow the page um, because that's the kind of the difference on there. But um, yeah, because again, we're always putting out cool stuff on there too. Um, we do have a YouTube channel too, though, for the growing farmers. So definitely check that out too, because I do a lot of educational videos there. Whereas on the Facebook, Facebook page for the farm. It's literally completely 100% customer fo focused. The YouTube channel is going to be the farm focus. Love that. Love that. Well, all those links, except for the Facebook will be around this video. Um, <laughs> I love that. The fact that you even track in those numbers of organic reach on a page. So um, kudos to you for understanding all these metrics in your business. Uh, Michael has been great chatting to you. Uh, we're going to have to sign off and uh, any final words to leave the community thinking. Yeah. Just thanks so much for having me. And uh, I, again, it just comes back to the numbers. Everything comes back to the numbers. Obviously we have incredible heart and soul in what we put into it. And it's incredible. You know, we're always thinking about the regen aspect, um, but also the, the numbers and sense have to make sense for us to have the triple bottom line we need to, to survive. Awesome. Well, on that note, everyone get outside, get your hands dirty and keep digging deeper into your soils. I'm Regen Ray. Well, soil lovers, that's enough secrets for one episode. I really hope that you enjoyed all the secrets shared during this conversation. But hey, let's not keep it a secret. Please share this podcast around and make sure that you like it and leave us a review because that really helps spread the secrets of the soil. Until next time, remember, get outside, get your hands dirty and keep digging deeper into your soils.